gatekeeping is natural. I'm not going to spend five minutes on the preamble this time or beat around the bush because it deserves to be said flat out and it also deserves to be said loudly. However, by saying these words, I'm also making a commitment to adequately articulate why I have said them and explain what they actually mean because the concept of gatekeeping does not and should not mean what mainstream sources often tell you it does. Gatekeeping is an angry white man's way of pushing minorities out of games. That's the kind of stuff that you'll often hear. Gatekeeping is just incels who don't like women that are strong and independent gamers. Stuff like that, routinely. The term is often used as an insult, and the intention is to bludgeon anyone who disagrees with that by marking them as some sort of antagonistic force that prevents others from having fun. That definition simply isn't true. It's partially true for a tiny, very tiny fraction of people. The same way it's true to say that conservatives are alt-right or Democrats are Antifa, because an extremely small number among those groups do fall into such categories, which holds true for gatekeepers as well, and this villain-esque definition. But the reality is blanket statements about a large group of people are often almost entirely wrong, and that remains consistent here with gatekeeping. So what is it really? The short answer is that it's just a way to protect the integrity of a system, not just games, but the long answer is that when communities grow, they attract many different perspectives, and those perspectives are not always symbiotic. Here's an example, and bear with me because it might seem strange at first, but I promise it'll make sense in the end. I am about to go skiing this week. I'm not a good skier, but I know how to do a, like a pizza slice and do a basic turn. I will be going to a ski mountain where there are trails from beginner to expert. What is it? Like green something to black diamond. And I will take the chairlift anywhere I want on that mountain and ski down whatever slope it is. These trail markers are the most basic form of gatekeeping. It's not forced and it's not mandatory in most cases, but they signify a particular difficulty that indicates whether or not you should go down that trail. Here's the thing, someone like me who sucks at skiing can easily just go to a black diamond and pizza slice their way down off of a cliff and into a snowbank. That's fine, I'm allowed to do it, I need to assume responsibility when it happens obviously, and I probably should have known better, but the only person it really affects is me, purely just me, and maybe the person who has to spend like what, five minutes getting me in a snowmobile, but that's their job, it mostly just affects me. Seems kind of unrelated to gatekeeping, right? Wrong, because this conveys the example of a static, immovable, relatively unchangeable landmark that we engage with knowing full well that we have no control over its composition. The architects behind the trails, sure, when it was built, they had control, but average skiers go to a mountain, they ride the trails, and they leave with absolutely no input, no influence, and no control over the slopes. Here's the problem. That immutable foundation changes when you consider the concept of gaming and digital fantasy worlds. The mountain doesn't move. If I go to a black diamond and wipe out 45 times, I don't get to the bottom of the slope and demand that the incline be made less steep for me because I simply don't have the option or the ability to do anything at all about the reality of that space. And I should rightly shut my mouth and ski within my skill bracket. In gaming, that barrier of physical permanence doesn't exist, and someone who skis the black diamond as an amateur can just take to social media and complain, which very tangibly ends, all too often, in modifications to the game itself being made. Because a mountain can't be patched with a new version overnight, like just a software update, while a video game can. That's just one example though. The value of gatekeeping is not framed around the attempt to bar anyone else from ever joining the space, despite what gaming journalists would attempt to claim more often than not, but instead framed around one's ability to protect the space itself from influence that degrades the overall experience. This is where an obvious counterpoint must be addressed. Degrades the experience for who though? What gives some people the right to dictate to others what the correct experience is? Something along those lines. Outside the very obvious answer of developers are able to dictate to players what the experience will be, there is a much more important parallel to draw. Tabletop gaming, and primarily, I guess for my purposes today, Dungeons & Dragons. Dungeons & Dragons is most often experienced in smaller groups of close, personal friends. Of course, it can be played with larger, less integrated communities, but the typical format would be a group of friends who know each other to some degree or another, joining up for an evening campaign. The idea of gatekeeping is not to bar anyone ever from joining these groups. It is to protect the experience that these groups have. Example, group A is composed of, let's say, 10 friends who all get along decently well. They bicker and fight traditional friend things, sure, but their tabletop gaming sessions are a weekly dose of fun that they generally thoroughly enjoy. Group A, having done this for, let's say, a few months, 
realizes that one of their neighbors, like down the hall, directly adjacent to them, is interested in being part of the activity. They know this neighbor a little bit, most of them, and they also feel that they shouldn't be barring anyone from participating because gatekeeping is so wrong to do. Group A meets for their weekly game, the neighbor joins in, and though they have very little relative knowledge of the game at that point, everyone honestly starts somewhere and they end up being a perfectly fine addition to the activity. Great. Cool. That's exactly how it's supposed to be. Well, Group A, now including Neighbor B, attracts the attention of Neighbor C, a completely different neighbor. Neighbor C doesn't know them quite as much, but once again, familiar with some of the people in the group, and they feel it's not really the right call to tell them no because the activity is for everyone, after all, and they proceed with next week's game. Well, Neighbor C, the third addition to this game, doesn't get the process at all. Not only that, they hate the randomization of the dice and constantly complain that it's unfair or rigged. They demand that they be allowed to use different dice with better odds on their turn. They ask to change the direction of the party at inopportune times, trying to control other people's actions, and generally speaking, they negatively impact the enjoyment of everyone around them constantly. What does our friendly group of players decide to do? Well, they can let this person literally ruin their hobby, or they can gatekeep. The concept of gatekeeping is to protect the enjoyment and experience of those that existed in the space to begin with. Nothing prevents neighbor C from hosting their own game, with modified rules even. Nothing prevents them from inviting further players to that separate event. And more importantly, nothing prevents them from actually participating in the existing weekly game without ruining it for everyone else. But the way they choose to interact with the space is to demand that the space itself change, not just for them, but for those around them in order to accommodate their personal preferences. That's where the difference lies. When I go skiing, there is no possible change to be inflicted upon the mountain itself. I can demand that they make the black diamonds less steep, as an example, but in the end, I cannot impact what already exists. In gaming, that's not the case. I can demand ridiculous things. I can demand difficulty augmentations or mechanical changes that redefine the core enjoyment loop for the community that has been playing for possibly years. And depending on tone, what lies I choose to tell, how I frame my argument, who I even am as a personal human being, and how many other people like me decide we want this space, change it for us, we want it to be different now, I absolutely could impact the overall experience. But here's the part that gets usually missed these days. Gatekeeping and the simple idea of trying to protect something that you care about from being changed or ruined in a way that hurts your own enjoyment is something everyone does. Not only is it exceptionally common, it's also often extremely healthy. When you enjoy something and someone comes in saying, hey, I know you like this, but what about these particular additional features that would open the door for me to also like it just as much as you? You will be very hard pressed to find anyone really who objects to that proposition. But when you are faced with someone demanding, change it, change it now, change it fully. I don't care what you like, I want it to be better for me, not for you. What you like is wrong. That will be, and should be, met with absolute hostility. Additionally, and this is actually a very important side note, an honest, sincere request to learn about a community, or any given activity at all, is almost always going to be met with support and assistance. If your response to someone saying, do you enjoy Dungeons and Dragons, is anything akin to, yes, but I'm certainly no expert and I would love to learn more, you will be struggling constantly to find anyone who would be anything other than enthusiastic about that and willing to offer help, advice, or information. However, if your response is, yeah, duh, and then you proceed to tell them how the one campaign that you know anything about is better than all the others for reasons that actually make no legitimate sense, as well as how certain things should be changed because the racial stat modifiers are racist or something absurd like that, well, you should understand that you aren't going to be received well into that community. They are going to gatekeep you. And really, you shouldn't be received well. Many of the most vocal and loud voices in today's gaming world would have you believe that gatekeeping is like a guy standing at the top of a black diamond trail on a ski mountain saying, you can't go down this if you aren't an expert. Prove to me that you're an expert and anything less is unacceptable. When in reality, gatekeepers are the people in the lodge who tell you to get out and not come back when you are making a scene about how black diamond trails all over the place should be changed because they aren't fun or appealing to me personally. Gatekeepers are the people saying, stop peeing in the middle of the trail. The mountain provides fun, yes, but if that's your version of fun, you don't belong here and you don't deserve to be heard or ever even considered. 
The phrase, okay, are you ready for a hot take? The phrase, everyone's opinion matters, is a fundamentally evil concept. It's not true and should never be true because some opinions are aimed at affecting change in a space that would be fundamentally destroyed for its existing audience and fans if that opinion were to be acted on. Those people should be excised from the community, else they pollute and degrade everything around them. Now, here's a very, very important side note. This concept does not hold true in all areas of life. We live in a world where the worst among us often sees power in their own space, and these real-world implications of the word gatekeeping should not be willfully misrepresented as some sort of counter-argument or gotcha, but within the context of a digital fantasy world. That's what I'm talking about. Within the context of gaming, video games, that industry, those that enter a space and participate to the benefit of its community should always be welcomed. And those who enter with an expressly defined intention to alter that community's operations, specifically in a way that degrades the experience and harms the existing population, those individuals will always be rejected by the people that came before, by the community which happily existed there to begin with. To be clear, none of this defines whether or not one side or the other should win, or anything similar to that word. It explains that the concept of gatekeeping is a natural, common, healthy phenomenon wherein people who occupy a space originally and enjoy that space as well seek to protect it from those who would harm it deliberately. If the group entering proceeds to gather the numbers, the influence, and the power to affect change anyway despite that resistance, and it becomes a new space and they now control it and enjoy it instead, that's also a pretty natural occurrence, but this ill-defined and fraudulent claim that gatekeeping is damaging, vile, prejudiced, and any other ist or phobic you can think of is nothing more than idiocy, propagated by those who fail to see the natural premise of rejecting others who would hurt your own experience. Bottom line, gatekeeping is not a negative phenomenon. Gatekeeping is a natural phenomenon that has a very real, very valuable purpose. It's not necessarily always positive either, but it should be accurately understood for what it really is, rather than some twisted and weaponized alteration of what the concept really means, what it actually means. When the media, the activists, and the loudest among us condemn gatekeeping as vile and horrific, they are condemning a phantom of their own imagination, and fail to understand even a basic premise behind what the action of gatekeeping really is, and ultimately what it represents. But that's it. All of this was because it kind of trended on Twitter and a lot of people were talking about it recently, so I wanted to put out my own thoughts because a lot of people being called gatekeepers and being condemned and chastised, they don't really deserve it. And the word is really twisted and doesn't mean what people think it means. It's a really complicated topic, but anyway, if you want to support, there are links down below, primarily Odyssey, which is a YouTube platform alternative, which greatly rewards its creators. My entire video library is on there, and I'll be experimenting in the coming days and weeks with putting some videos on there early before they show up on YouTube, like timed exclusivity. Not permanently, but just for a little bit. I'll, I'll figure it all out. Also, Locals, where you can subscribe for $5 a month. I put videos on that platform ad-free, as well as the raw audio files, plus the same type of early postings. And that kind of stuff, I'll be working on more stuff for locals in the near future. Um, yeah, check it out if you have any desire. There's another gaming YouTuber to check out, merch, social media, etc., etc. But I'll cut it there and stop rambling. As always, thank you all for watching and have a nice night.